Good day, good folks. You are listening to Talk That Keeps You Woke. And with your awakening, we hope that you will take in the information and knowledge we provide. So make sure you like and subscribe while you hop on this ride as we inform, persuade, entertain, and engage in discussion. Welcome to Pot Liquor Podcast, which is knowledge to feed your soul. I may go one half of Pot Liquor. I go by Dr. A, the inquisitive one. A great debater, Mr. Slow Talker, a rhetorician, and an all-around nice guy, and a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. The other half of Pot Liquor is my homie, my dear friend for more than 30 years, Ken Parker Jackson Esquire, the legal one, Mrs. Creativity, never obnoxious, the gifted one, a terrific lady, and a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Hey, what's happening, partner? How was your week? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My week was good, Dr. A, and I am well. How are you, and how was your week? I'm fine. Like I said last week, the days are narrowing down for the end of the semester. So everything looks good with my students, and um, I hope everything turns all right. Out all right for those who put the work in. Well, all right. As always, we start our show with a wow for the week. And our wow stands for words of wisdom. And this is coming from former First Lady Michelle Obama. Failure is an important part of your growth. Don't be afraid to fail. This is a sentiment that um, I teach at the university. Uh, and I, I say that because I feel like a lot of students today don't want to raise their hand um, because if they answer something wrong, they feel like it's a huge reflection on them. And you come to school to learn uh, what you don't know, you find out. And that's great about education. So I have something where I say I put my ignorance on this table it means like if I don't know something, I'm going to be the first to say, excuse me, what does that mean? And I'm OK with it. And usually after that happens. My fellow classmates will say, I'm glad you asked that question because I wasn't going to ask it, but I didn't know. And I don't think that uh, is progressive. It doesn't get you anywhere. Your purpose when you're at a university is to consume knowledge and not to be afraid of knowledge that you don't know. Um, and stop worrying about what other people think about you. What say you? I agree wholeheartedly. And I would just add that there are many successful people who have failed along their path to success. And MJ, Mike, Michael Jordan, said, he has failed over and over and over again, and that is why he su he's successful. And also, Thomas Edison famously said that he hasn't failed. He's just, there were just 10,000 ways that didn't work <laughs> before that. So we all have to uh, not be afraid to fail and just keep trying and never give up. So, I agree. Words of wisdom, indeed, from uh, our beloved Michelle Obama. Yes. So, once again, failure is an important part of your growth. Don't be afraid to fail. And let us move on. Oh, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? You know, before we get to what's going on, let us go to our first product. Okay. Okay, so our product for this week are Prada glasses. I know y'all are all familiar with the name Prada. Well, if you're not, uh, <laughs> it's kind of a, an expensive brand. But here are my glasses. Here's one pair. You've seen me uh, 
wearing them on the show. My students call it uh, the Harry Potter glasses. I find that funny. <laughs> and also, here's a, a um, another pair. Uh, these are more uh, square shaped glasses, but they both do the job. They're both Prada, and I do like them. And let us move on. So, what's going on in the world today? Happening, um, but we're going to start with the Texas. So, Texas Senate gives first okay to a bill that limits teaching political beefs. What this is actually saying is they feel that professors can't compel or force to students to believe in something that they're teaching. Um, I've been teaching at the collegiate level since 2013. I don't know of any professor that does this. Um, we open up about certain things and I know for me, I'll speak for myself. There's just constantly questions and challenges and Q and A's and good debates in the class. I don't tell my students, you must believe this, or you must believe that, you know, I don't say any of that. I don't really inquire too much about um, their beliefs because they're really not going to answer them. If I do it, I use this uh, software or this program called Poll Everywhere. You should check it out. And it gives students complete anonymity. Like, so if I bring up something like, why would you or, would, or why would you not support the death penalty? They're allowed to answer. We don't know who says what, but then we can talk about, like, let's talk about the individual that says this, you know, or talk about what this individual says to be more appropriate. So this is some effort to me to censor uh, instructors. What say you? I would have to agree with that, that this is just another bad idea from the Abbott administration. And I agree with the professor who said that their, their worry here is basically that Senate Bill 16, which this is, is a, a solution in search of a problem because <laughs> there's no evidence that this is happening, first of all. So that's why I just think it makes absolutely no sense. There's, you know, again, no evidence that professors are trying to compel their students to adopt any particular kind of belief, whether it's about a, a race, a sex, ethnicity, social, political, religious belief. Nobody is making anybody is or compelling students to believe one way or the other. I believe most professors, and, and you can attest to this yourself, Dr. A, are basically helping their students to practice critical thinking skills. That's all. And so it doesn't matter. Um, I know from law school, when you uh, when there's an essay question that you have to do on a particular issue, on a particular legal issue, it's not as important um, what your answer, what your overall answer is to a question. What's most important is your rationale and how and how you analyze the facts in a particular situation. And you may come out one way or the other. Um, but what's most important is how you reason that conclusion out. So the same thing applies here for students that may be sitting in your class, Dr. A. They may be Democrats. They may be Republicans. They may have, a, you know, one particular uh, belief on a, on, on a specific issue and come out one way or the other. They could be for it or against it. And I, I would, I would, so my, I would uh, say that a professor wouldn't necessarily care as much how they come out. They would care more about how they can support their position, how they may argue for or against a particular position. And so, and that's what we go to school to learn, you know, how to think critically. So I just think this is another overreach by, you know, 
um, the state Senate here. And just a bad idea. I mean, this is, it's a waste of time, a waste of effort for legislators to come up with these make-believe, they, they make believe that there's a problem and then they come up with these crazy quote unquote solutions. So now they want to stop teachers or stop professors from teaching particular issues. I, I I don't even know what the what the goal is here, but I would say there's no there's no problem to solve here. So yeah, when when I teach, um I explain my reasoning behind my beliefs. Mm -hmm. Like say for instance, you know, um a lot of people um have been a success story in the neighborhood uh, that I grew up with, uh, the majority of the people, because it was a cycle, the majority of people that I grew up have, you know, and I'm proud to say have broken that cycle um, um, and have moved up um, into different socioeconomic statuses. Um, so, so, but I would tell, my students, the reason why I vote a certain way is based on my frame of reference. Like I am a proponent of welfare. I'm not ashamed to say it. And the myth I hear from my students is like they don't work. They're just trying to siphon and get money off of uh, the government. And where I grew up, the ladies did work. Uh, families did work that were on welfare. Um, so it just augmented, which they needed help. They needed housing. They needed food stamps. They needed health care. They needed those things to survive, you know, a tough life. And they got up and they went to work on top of that. Um, and their kids benefited from that. Like I said, a lot of us, you know, broke the cycle. <clears throat> and so, but I tell them that's the reason why I vote that way, because I still think people of all races need that help. And I think you measure a country on how they help their, their young kids and their old, their uh, old folks, you know, uh, or their disabled folks. Um, if you have the money to do it, you know, this country is successful enough where we have the money to do it and we do it. And that's a good thing. I agree. But I don't I don't force them to pick up that belief if they're like, well, I vote against welfare. I'm like, OK, fine. I don't have an issue with that. So Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said liberal professors determined to indoctrinate our students with their woke brand of revision revisionist history have gone too far. Now, that statement is just making me think that the Republican Party and specifically Texas um, here basically thinks that I, I'm beginning to think they think education in general is part of uh, a liberal agenda, a, li a liberal democratic agenda. And they think just teaching facts, I think they have a problem with that. Just teaching facts about our history, they have a problem with because they, you know, information is enlightening. And so they're thinking if professors are teaching our history, that people are going to be indoctrinated. Now, how, how is that possible? If you're teaching facts from our history, how are you indoctrinating someone? So I'm beginning to think that they're just attacking education in general. And that's what's unfortunate, you know, unfortunate about, about the situation and about re the Republican Party in general. They're becoming the, the party of anti-education, basically. Um, I think students, and I'll speak particularly to white students, are going home and challenging their parents mm -hmm. with information that they are receiving. They also feel like if you look at social media and media, there are a lot of students out there campaigning that are, quote unquote, what they call woke students campaigning. And it gives the student at the collegiate level an option or to way to look at something else that's articulated by a different face. And I think, and this is just my theory, I think parents are worried about that and they voice their complaints. And so politicians come out 
and they say things like, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, they, they're against this woke education. This has been going on for years since before, like in the 60s. In the, and, you know, governments never uh, banned anything. So why now? Like, why are you doing it now? This professors have been spewing their ideas and their beliefs. Um, I'm not still going to say no professor forced me on their beliefs. Um, and I've been in education for a while. That's never happened. So um, I think that they're worried now that it may be starting to stick. And their well, kids, their kids are bringing it home, so they show concern. What you think? Well, I think that people are beginning to become enlightened with the truth about what has happened in America in our past. For example, with all of the new information that has come, well, well, with all of the new information that has come out about some historic figures after which many monuments have been named, and we come to find out that these were people from our from the Confederacy who promoted segregation, promoted racial hatred, and all of those things, people are now becoming aware of that. And once we become aware of it, you have to take responsibility for your knowledge and things start to change. And so I think the Republican Party is trying to stem the tide of the change that is happening. They don't want any more monuments to come down. But once, you know, as long as we remain ignorant and in the dark, then nobody will be, you know, we will be none the wiser. Nobody will have to uh, demand that these monuments come down. But once you are armed with that knowledge and information, you are responsible for making a change. And they know that if our young people become more and more educated about the history of this country, they're going to make changes and we're not going to have the status quo continue anymore. And so I think that's what they're trying to, trying to, to prevent. And that's why they're attacking education. They would rather their children remain ignorant regarding our history. Because once they know, once again, you are responsible for what you know. You cannot let things continue as they have been. And you are going to want to make a change. See what I'm saying? I got you. Yeah. And let us move on. And the walls came tumbling down. A segregation wall was constructed right near Morgan State University back in the 30s and 40s. And now they are tearing down that wall, um, which is very interesting because I am an alum of Morgan State University. And I would like to say, while I was there, the late Dr. Lucia Hawthorne, who was my also my advisor there, uh, told the class, the students, about this wall. It was right. I used to live on the street right behind it too. My second year, and my dorm, my, the, my dorm, my dorm window. Shout out to Cummings Hall was. Um, right across from Sofa Library, which is not there anymore, and behind Sofa Library was the wall on Hillen Road. And the wall was crumbling down while we were at the institution. Mm -hmm. um, it was a wall, you know, architecturally, it was kind of, it was beautiful. It had like the little big circles in the wall that they built, but we also knew it was a segregation wall. Um, found out like white folks that lived in these communities were upset that black folks were being allowed to be like assimilated and indoctrinated into society with, you know, uh, equal rights and things of that nature. So they didn't want to see the uh, black kids uh, going to the school when they moved to school. I think they moved to school in 1917, was it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, and they put it where on um, Cold Spring and Helen. And I remember these discussions, these talks. Wait, but the wall was built in, in like 42, 43, 1942, 1943. Right. right? Okay. Right. Go ahead. 
So, but they just got to, because because the school when it started was small, you know. Right. Thousands. And then they saw all these Negroes coming in and they right. were like, wait a minute now. We don't want to see y'all going to get an education. <laughs> this is a what? This is a what neighborhood. We don't want all these Negroes. But it's, 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 it's amazing that it took this long because I graduated in May of 1991. So That's the question that I was going to ask. 30, 32 years ago. Like, you know, when I left. Um, and so when I saw the news, I was like, well, yeah, it's about time they they've done that. Um, and it's just going to look better anyway. Well, I'm um, curious, like what. So Dr. Hawthorne brought this to to the class's attention. Um, first of all, what did Dr. Hawthorne teach? She just was curious. a communication professor. Communication. And she was also and, in your sorrow. Oh, OK. And so she, of course the torch of wisdom being passed, but um, she, and so she told you guys about the history of this wall and what was the general reaction of this, the student body? But see the general reaction was like, wow, but like, wow, we didn't know that. And we've been looking at this wall all this time and we didn't know that's what it was for. No, like wow, that was fucked up what they did. Like okay, but here, but 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 I do have another question. Can you explain? So, did the wall actually prohibit you from moving into that neighborhood? Like you couldn't walk into that. No, you could walk up the street and turn it because that's what I was gonna say. When we came, when we came to Morgan, the neighborhood was all black. It was nothing but black folks there. Okay. Yeah. By the time we got there, fall of eighty seven. There might have been some white folks there, but the majority of people, because I lived on one of the blocks, and it, it was it was a, a, a deep, um, a large community. It was uh, row houses, attached row houses. But was yeah. it so? It looked nice though. It wasn't like an eyesore. It was like well, you just thought it was a like a graffiti wall or no? It was it, it the parts that were fully erected looked uh -huh. nice. The parts that were falling down, you were like, ah, they need to, you know. Uh, take that down because you could walk across the grass and walk step over a part of the wall that was all the way down oh. into the neighborhood. Okay, like and one, how, just one of the blocks, though. <clears throat> oh, I was about to ask you, like, how many blocks do you think it spanned? It spanned probably like five or six blocks. Maybe. Wow, it's yeah. incredible when you think about it. It's like people had so much hate in their hearts mm -hmm. that they literally built a wall. And that's what I think of when I think like Trump wanting to build a wall to keep, you know, um, immigrants from coming into the into the United States. Anytime you build a wall, if there's just no positive connotation to building a wall, you know what I mean? It's like you want that division. So that's unfortunate. I'm glad that it's coming down now, though. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, it was unfortunate. Um, but like I said, given that there were black people living over there now, there wasn't a thought to tear it down. Then I'm thinking that was the reason why they probably didn't tear, tear it down. Um, but since then, there's been a lot of re renovation done at Morgan State. And the campus was beautiful when I was there. And it's even more uh, beautiful now. So I was also curious because it was uh, it was approved by like a zoning board, which to me is, sounds like a local um, governing. The local governing body is what made the decision to erect the wall. And so. I was just wondering, just like you, like, why did it take so long for them to to tear it down? And then who actually approved it? Would, would the state have to approve it, tearing the wall down? Because it's it's not like it belonged to Morgan State University and they could just unilaterally say. It was the city. It was the city. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought I, I just thought about that because it says that the president of the university, David Wilson, said we had no choice but to tear it down. It was time for us to just tear tear down that hate. And it just made it seem like it was Morgan's decision, you know. So Yeah, and I'm sure like they didn't have a fight with the uh city uh to get it torn down or the neighborhood to get it torn down. Um, I think Morgan is located like in the northeast section of Baltimore. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Nice neighborhoods, you know, middle class families. Um, At least it was when I was there. It it was quiet. There were some, you know, areas, spots they told you to look out and walk with a group of people if you're going to certain places, like just up to the 7-Eleven and things of nature. But, you know, all universities. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, precautions like, you know, all, you know, all universities, um, you know, will put that out. The other thing I thought was interesting is that a spokesperson for Morgan, her name is Cheryl Stewart. She says destroying the wall is part of a major reconstruction and expansion at the university called Morgan Momentum. I thought that was that was nice. So they're just trying to move forward. And the last thing that I found interesting was that um, the president of the university said that they don't plan to ignore the past now that the wall is gone. And instead, they're going to keep a small part of the wall in place as a historical marker so students can learn about the dark history of the wall. How do you feel like uh, about that as an alum of the school? Like, because to me, it's almost like keeping Confederate mo- monuments. It's like, yeah, I was like, going to say that. Like, a lot <laughs> of people had those arguments that if you know you keep the Confederate statues up, you get to learn who this individual is. Uh, other people were like, "Why are we honoring these individuals?" That, right. that kind of was the 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 beef then, because I would say to Republicans who want to do away with not teaching, you know, the bad history of. Mm-hmm. Uh, the United States, then why would y'all want to maintain the statues? Because if the statue is outside of one of the schools, what are you going to do? Just talk about the positives of this individual? Like, and I'm, I'm specifically talking about Robert E. Lee, and there were a lot of people that were bad. Um, so I, I have no issue getting away for that. As, as a part of a reminder, you Republicans feel like what's the need to remember bad things that the United States did. They feel like all you're doing is making the country more divisive, as in your lack of opportunities for uh, minorities don't make things divisive. Like your lack of opportunity. And I know some Republicans, like it's just black folks have a begging mentality. They're always trying to get jobs, like create your own jobs. Like, well, the banks treat us unfair. And we can, it's a, there's a litany of things that that go on. But as an alum, to answer your question, I'm okay with that. I'm always, you know, I'm an instructor. So <laughs> yeah. my knowledge is, you know, always the way to go for me. So I don't have yeah. it. And I agree. I mean, if you don't know the history, you're doomed to repeat it. So I think we all need to know the dark part of our history so that we won't repeat it and we can start to see signs and prevent, you know, nip it in the bud. So I'm all for it. And let us move on. But I heard that. All right. So (laughs) Tim Scott is about to throw his hat in the race for president. And because of this news, we wanted to speak about him and black Republicans. But I want to hear that beat one more time. But I heard that. Hey. 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 Shout out to Stetson Son and, and James Brown. This is, this is one of the hottest beats when we were growing up. All right. So, yes, let's talk about Tim Scott and the black Republicans. I'm going to let you start this one off. Remember when we play culture? Remember we play culture tags? Yeah. I-D-G-A-F. Yeah. (laughs) For the sake of our show, let's not (laughs) I-D-G-A-F. That's how I really feel about it. But at the end of the well, I was I will just say that I think Tim Scott, first of all, he's just announced that he is establishing an exploratory committee to run for the presidency. So it's not a done deal yet. Um, I think he's 
putting his feelers out to see what the response will be, see how much money he can raise, and then, you know, determine what really the viability of any particular, uh, any presidential campaign would be. But I think really he is taking the, um, the Kamala Harris approach here. I think he's actually running for vice president. I think he wants to be on a ticket with Trump because he said in 2021 that if Trump announces that he's running for president, that he's not going to put his hat in the ring. And so why else would he be backtracking on that? So I, I honestly think he's campaigning really to be whoever the, probably Trump, but whoever the Republican nominee is, he wants to be on the ticket with that person as, as a vice president. That's that's what I think. So, <coughs> what do you think? Well, I'm not surprised uh, he didn't respond to that statement that he issued. Like, if Trump is running again, I'm not going to run. Mm -hmm. um, and your argument or your theory is plausible. Um, mm -hmm. He could be doing that. But this just sparked me to have a conversation about uh, black Republicans. Because I think um, a lot of them get a bad rap. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, I always say that black folks aren't uh, monolithic. I agree. And so... A lot of people just say, hey, if you're a black Republican, they just throw you to the wolves. Like, if you if you support Trump, you know, because there are a lot of black Republicans that don't support Trump. Right. I think when people say black people should not support the Republican Party, I think they're saying what it represents. Not every black Republican um is 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 going to dis disagree with issues that democrats agree with do you see what i'm saying because a lot of quiet is kept truth be told there are many democrats black democrats who are very conservative and so they try to polarize us by you know saying that the Democrat, you know, the Republican Party is conservative, the Democratic Party is liberal, but it really depends on the issue. But the as a whole, the Republican Party, I think, is anti-diversity, anti-education, anti you anti uh constitution as far as i'm concerned so i mean it you know it it just it's issue by issue for me but i would have to say you know overall i don't see how a black person could support this republican party they're anti democratic because they there's all kinds of uh voter suppression laws that they want to pass but there are two sectors of the republican republican party there's a radical like what's, what's her name margie teller green mm -hmm. you know um and then there are other folks that um don't um believe in what she believes in i get that but you're still supporting this party as a whole do you see what I'm saying? And I just, I don't see how you could do it. I really don't. I mean, a well, lot of they might be supporting like their stake in the party. Like if they're running for a position, if they speak out against the Republican Party, they'll lose the Republican vote. And they're playing a dangerous game, but they're playing this game because they want to remain in their current positions. Okay. So you're talking about, are we talking about black? See, there's, there's two different things. Are we talking about black politicians or are we talking about black people who align themselves with the Republican Party? Do you see what I'm saying? 
Yes, I'm talking about both. Okay. You know, because the people we have up, for those who are watching on our video streams, the people we have up here are um, people that are in Congress and then used to be in Congress, um, uh, not just in Congress, like a part of, like we have Condoleezza Rice that's up here, Ben Carson, um, Colin Powell, Tim Scott, Candace Owens, Michael Steele, Caldwell, um, Condoleezza Rice. Yeah, I started with her. Tim. Oh, Scott, you did. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there are a lot of people. Daniel Cameron. Um, right. Michael Steele. Cameron. Did you say Michael Steele? Michael Steele. Yeah. Yeah, but see, remember, remember, Kamala Harris said that America is not a racist country. So your statement about uh, black politicians trying to sort of straddle the fence to remain in in power. It happens on. It happens with Democrats and Republicans. I mean, that's just being a politician, right? That's what but, I'm saying. Like some of right. them are playing that. Like some people will say it don't matter. They shouldn't be playing that role, and I understand that. The black, the black politician shouldn't be playing that role. Yeah. I mean, if this is what they truly believe, it's what they believe. I mean, it's nothing. I'm to the point now where. At the end of the day, we all only have one vote. My job is not to try to convince you that you shouldn't vote Republican. I, I really, that's, that's up to you because we, like I said, we all have one vote. I know how I'm going to vote. I just have decided as, as a person that I do not want to support the Republican Party. I don't want them to be in power. So I'm going to exercise my one vote to vote Democratic because that's the party that I want to be in control. Now, are they solving every issue, every problem that we have as Americans? No, but it is the party that most aligns with what I believe in. And so that's all any of us can do. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of trying to convince Black people that they shouldn't be voting Republican. Not not this Republican Party that wants to suppress our vote, that wants to remain in power, wants to take away a woman's autonomy over her body, that doesn't want everyone to have health care and, and, and be able to make a decent living with one job because they don't want to raise the minimum wage. I mean, I no, negative. So that's my belief. So... I, the, I have a problem when black Republicans try to convince me that I shouldn't vote Democrat and that they try to convince me that the Republican Party has my best interests as, at heart as a black person. That's where I draw the line. That's ridiculous. I find it, <clears throat> see, it's difficult to have blanket statements about either party. That's first place. One thing I say about the black Republicans and Democrats, I'm a registered independent for a reason. Um, it's like hyperbole. That's the word I'm going to use. When you like make over general statements? Yeah, like overhyping things. Like you have the nerve, like Tim Scott said, I'm glad that the Democrats are afraid of me. Like my life and what I live just shows how much they lie. And so I'm saying everybody that's a Democrat, that's, you know, a lot of African-Americans, let's talk about them, that are Democrats. Like they live your life too. So if, you know, because you're not the only person that grew up financially impaired. You're not the only person that was poor. Right. In the country. So so just to have a blanket statement, and I say this against the Democrats too, just have a blanket statement to say like one party is just awful. Like when you can't pull out a person's good points and say anything, I have an issue with you. you right. Know? And like even when I talk to a student, like if they do good, if they say they did bad on the test, the first thing I'm going to do <clears throat> is tell them the good things that they did. Right. And then I'm going to go into the poor things 
in areas they need to improve on. I never hear any side saying like, well, there's nothing good about what either party does. Right. Um, I, when you're talking like that, it's a turn off to most people because you're insulting people's intelligence. Right. And, and that's why I brought up the point that many black people have conservative views about particular issues. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So it's, you know, it's not all, it's not all one way or all another way, but at the end of the day, we but have, that's a not said often though. What's not said often? It, that it, it, that it's not all the way one way or all the way the other. I think our discussions and our arguments start from that point. Like stop saying that everybody that's a part of one of these parties are, are bad people. Um, or stupid because they think a particular way. A lot of these folks are highly educated. They just have different beliefs. So why are we stumping their beliefs? My problem and issue is the incendiary language used against one another. You know, I'd rather you say, well, you know, the Republican Party is for abortion. And if you're for abortion, then, yeah, you may want to align yourself with the Republican Party. I believe in reproductive. You mean, uh, you mean against abortion? You said for abortion. Well, the Re Republican Party is for abortion. Republican Party is anti-abortion. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. 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 <laughs> I mean, you're right. I know what I know what you mean. The Republican mean. Party is against abortion. So right. if you are against abortion. You should align yourself with the Republican Party. Thanks for that correction. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. And you can say that. And be cool because everybody doesn't have to be, you know, for reproductive rights. I don't see why people get angry over that. Because see, but the thing, but the thing is, is that it's not as if the Democratic Party is for nobody is very few people are for abortion. Nobody wants to have an abortion like, oh, this is fun. Let's have some abortions. It's not like that. Pe women just want to have the right to make a choice and a decision if they need to. Nobody, I don't know any woman who is excited or eager to have an abortion. We just want to have the option to make a medical decision about our own bodies. That's all. And so, you know, that's why I say Many black people, you know how you know how black people are. We're very conservative when it comes to sex, especially we teach our young people to abstain as long as possible. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I'm saying you making a blanket statement too, homie. Okay. You don't know that. A lot of people, because I ask students in my class how many parents have talked to them about sex. They don't. The church may <clears throat> say something if they attend church, but a lot of them get their lessons from their friends. So what yeah, I'm, I'm saying just, is like we're conservative on some issues. Yeah, because I do yeah. agree that we don't think you should just get rid of a baby to get rid of a baby. But what I'm saying is that African-Americans who are against reproductive rights, let's say that, let's use that, then use the word abortion. Exactly. The reason why they, is, they are for that because they feel those that are Christian feels like Thou shall not kill. And so that's their reason. I'm like, okay, that's your reason. That's why we got to bring it to a vote. But when we start calling people stupid because they have that belief, that's when the beef starts. And that's when it just... Who, who call people stupid? I, I hear it on the media all the time. Okay. So it's... Well, I don't say that because, I, like I said, at the end of the day, we, we each have one vote. It's just that the Republican Party <laughs> is going to make it as difficult as possible for you to exercise that one vote, especially if you're Black. Because all of these voter suppression laws are in uh, uh, effect. Mo they mostly negatively impact Black towns, like Black cities. Yeah, but I, I, I haven't seen, and, and I could be wrong on this one, I haven't seen a Black person pushing that agenda. Not one Black Republican talking about voter suppression. Like, you need IDs when you come to this place or that. I haven't heard. I'm not saying that hasn't happened. 
I'm just like when they have these black Republicans on on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, you know, they yeah. most. Yeah, but they, they'll say, I, why would you not want to be able to why, why, why would you not want people to have to show their ID? To right. Vote? Right. Like, that's just reasonable. They want your ID to vote, but right. they don't want no uh, registration if you get a gun. They don't want no background check if you get a gun. Right. But they want you to show your ID to vote. Like, really? Right. What? How much but, sense but, does but, that make? See, that's what I'm saying. Sense. When you when you go there, when you talk about how much sense, you're insulting. What I'm saying is the language between black folks. Hold on. Between I didn't black call anybody stupid. I said no, the, it's, the it's, legislation. You're implying. Is you're implying. Okay, you're in, you you just said what they say, right? And to you, right. you, it's like, what kind of sense does that make? It makes sense to them, right? That's what I'm saying. So when you say that emphatically like that, it is, I'm a calm professor, so excuse that. So to me, we as Black Republicans and Black Democrats, right, should be able to have a conversation that is not in the incendiary and is not okay. smart mouth with smart lips. That's true. Let me read. Let me let me read. Day, when we go home, these black families, what they got black kids. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase it. Right? Let, me re let me rephrase it. That's a contradiction. It's a contradiction to require somebody to show an ID to vote, but you don't have to do a background check or register to openly carry a weapon. When when I see black Republicans dancing around issues, this is what they do. So when they ask, so you don't think there should be background checks or you don't think assault weapons should be banned? This is what I hear some of them say. We can visit that issue. We can discuss that issue. They don't vote. They don't say, yeah, I believe. And yeah, I think there's two of them that do. Um, but they don't jump and say, you know, Yes and no. They tried to dance around it. These politics that are uh, are black Republicans. Now we, I, know, I know the the black Republicans that are not politicians say, yeah, I'm. You know, I think they should have a background check, or, or you know, uh, or they should ban assault weapons. So what I'm saying, there's a lot of similarities, but they're never talked about because. You know, again, I know, but see, you're talking, you're comparing individuals versus parties. Do you see what I'm saying? But we talking so about there are individuals in both parties who have differing. We, we talking about black positions on particular issues, right? We're challenging black Republicans uh, are being challenged because they're with a party right. that a lot of African Americans disagree with, right? So we're trying to say, like, what are you getting out of it? And they'll tell you things like when they talk with, I forgot this guy's name, Terrence something. He wears the black glasses. He is a straight Trumper. And they bring him on the, the television because he's very provocative. If, what black folks need to start saying is like, I don't want to debate Terrence. Democrats need to say that I don't, I don't want to debate him. So if you have me on with him, I'm not addressing anything he says. Now no, he, he makes some points, but some points he makes is just you could tell like he can't speak out against Trump. So I would start off with is there anything you would like Donald Trump to change? And he's gonna hit you. Well, the Democrats need to, but I didn't ask you that. <laughs> we'll we'll, at, we'll ask you that after you answer this question. What you're trying to do is that I'm trying to have a discussion with you that doesn't get incendiary. But and you if said, you say no, that's fine. You said what do what do black Republicans get out of, re, of out of supporting the Republican Party? I would argue that many of them are basically just trying to be contrarian be, for selfish reasons because it increases their bottom line. They get paid, they get checks for being contrarian and for supporting you know, uh, that's what I said earlier. Republican Party on specific issues, yeah. Right. So that's what you, what you asked again. Like, what do they get out of it? That's no, no. Like, I'm saying that's, them, that's what, what they get out. No, of. I'm saying that's what I'm not asking that question. I'm saying that's what a lot of African Americans are asking that question. Oh, like what are they getting out of it? Yeah, yeah. What are they getting out of it? A check. They're getting a check, and they're maintaining you power. Check, you, the Democrats get checks. 
For supporting Republican positions? No, for supporting Democratic positions. Okay. But I mean, but they truly believe the what they're exactly. Saying. So you can't say you're I know you're not saying that the Republican the black Republicans don't believe in anything they say. They're just doing it to get a check. In some cases, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. And that is why. I think Tim Scott couldn't really defend his position on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. He couldn't really defend it. All he could do was say, I'm not voting for it. Because his explanation of why he wasn't voting for it didn't make sense. I, I just was like, make it make sense. The math is just not mathing. And so you have to conclude that if someone, just like we were discussing before, you have to be able to articulate your rationale for supporting one position versus another. So. I agree. Yeah. And let us move on. All right. So we had one other story to bring to you, but for the sake of time, we're going to jump over that. We're going to get into our second plug of the day, which is our brand. All right. So today we want to talk about Chanel. Now, I would say one of my favorite brands, but I haven't been able to purchase a Chanel bag in a long time since I've had kids. But I am a bag girl. Some of us girls really enjoy carrying our um, handbags. And so I want to share. Um, a couple of my favorites from Chanel. So this is my Chanel Grand Shopping Tote. Chanel Grand Shopping Tote in the beige color. It's more like a it's more like a camel color, and it's your basic tote bag with the iconic Chanel symbol on the front. And yeah. I purchased three Chanel bags that I own. I purchased before I had children. And so here is another. And, and you will see that I only this, um, purchased the classic ones. The second one is my Chanel clutch. This is um, the one that I will carry if I'm going to um, and after five event in the evening, you just want like a clutch, something you can put under your arm. See, my, my girlfriend um, wouldn't purchase that because it, it don't have the C's on it. Well, it don't, I don't see the C's on it. Well, the C's are on the class. Uh, okay. Then, then she will hold it that way. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at my clutch. Yes. This is a, this is a very classic um, handbag. They still have this. And you will see that, especially when I buy like luxury items. I will usually get like the classic piece because I keep it forever and they're expensive and I will always be in style. And here's the iconic Chanel flat bag. And this is the medium size. I have it in black. And yes, this is, I love this bag. It's classic, the classic a Chanel quilting. Um, and this one has the gold hardware. I think, um, the clutch has the silver hardware, but yes, I love, this is a nice bag to take out in the evening when you don't want to carry a lot of things, but you still want to be fashionable and cute, maybe go to dinner. And, um, so let's, let's talk about yeah. prices of those. Honestly, I can tell you how uh, approximately how much I pay for these, but the prices, and that's the other thing with Chanel, which is why I haven't purchased one since I had kids. The prices, because the prices go up every year. Um, so they, I mean, they've just. So what's the guess on how much they cost? They, they no longer want me as a customer. They've made that very clear because it's totally out of my price range now. But so for the, the tote bag, um, I have no idea how much this, this could probably be $5,000 right now. How um, much was it when you purchased it? I think I purchased this in 2007 for like $2,000, $2,200. And that was crazy back then. And this, um, the, the, um, 
the, the flat. classic flat bag. This is in a medium size. I think I bought this. Oh my god, early probably two thousand something, and it was like eleven hundred dollars. And I thought that was outrageous. This bag today could cost you six, five, six thousand dollars. No joke. Um, <laughs> and so in that case, I consider it an investment because I could probably sell it for that now or somewhere close to that. And this, I, I paid two thousand dollars for this which is outrageous. I don't know what I was thinking, but they're classic and I love them and I'll have them, you know, forever. I would never buy one today, but that's just me. And let us move on. We have a question. It's a question. Address the question. This is a question. So what's the question? Answer the question. Okay, the question of the week. What are two things you can never eat for breakfast? So email us at potlickershow at gmail.com. First one answers. Gets a surprise. Um, the last last week's question was, what goes up but never comes down? And the correct answer for that was age. Your age <laughs> continues to go up and not come down. Indeed. And let us move on. Like this. Keep it, keep on. So, today we want to talk about Dr. Percy LeVon Julian, our little known black history fact. Dr. Percy Julian, born in 1899, was one of the most important scientists in the 20th century. His 1935 invention of glaucoma medicine is counted among the top contributions in the history of U.S. chemistry. He graduated first in his class from DePaul University with a bachelor's degree in chemistry and earned his master's degree in chemistry from Harvard University. He was awarded a Ph.D. from the University of Vienna. He received the Spingarn Medal from the, double, the NAACP. He was the founder of Julian Laboratories, and he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. He has a U.S. Postal, Postal Service stamp in his honor, and he was recognized as a national, and it was recognized as a national landmark by the American Chemical Society. Dr. Percy LeVon Julian, our little known black history fact. All right. All right. And let us move on. Black. Black, black, black. Black on black, black, yeah, hey, okay, black, 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 black on black, black, my thoughts so black, black, black on black, my skin is so black, I'm rocking that black on black, is black, rims on this black wheel. All right, so <clears throat> this is our segment by black. We look for a company that is owned and run by an African American and promote it. This one is by a popular tennis player by the name of Venus Williams, and her product is called. 11. Um, it's kind of like sportswear, you know, a lot of seems like comfortable tennis outfits, but they're actually just like, I think, comfortable sportswear. Um, price is not that much. I've seen things from like $26 to like $128. Uh, so um, you could check out 
Venus is uh, 11. Um, I don't know how well it's doing, but it's been around for a while. So I, I hope it's doing well. If you are watching this on our video stream, you can see we have, what is it, like two, four, seven different uh, products from her glasses to her visor, her tank tops, her skirts, her sweatpants. Uh, Super cute. She has something called uh, skorts. Like it's a skirt and shorts and she's yeah. skorts. So what's your take on this? I like it from what I see. Um, I, I like what um, you're showing here and I would actually wear everything I see. And I like the colors too, like that beautiful um, green color. I like the yellow. I like the lilac. I love the colors. Perfect for spring and summer and super cute. The pleated little tennis skirt. I like it. Very nice. Yeah, I, I remember they did a special on her and she was talking about this. And this was, I, I want to say she's been doing this more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, because when she started doing it, she still was like prominent. So was her sister. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand her sister has a brand too, but we're going to focus on Venus this week. We may, you know, visit Serena next week. But Venus Williams, this is... 11 that we're checking out so check out hers i'm sure you can find it on her on her uh website and let us move on oh hell no we usually do it for you too. oh hell no all righty so i all oh, hell no this week is All right. This is Mark Teller who had a racist rant video. He coaches in the state of Georgia and uh he I don't know why he recorded this what was going on in his mind. But yeah, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, I listened to the video and it was um apparently recorded by his friend, someone he knows named Ro, because he referred to the person during the video. So this person, Ro, recorded this. And I don't know if Ro stabbed him in the back or what, but next thing you know, this is a viral video lace. I mean, with the N word <laughs> left and right. And I mean, it's just appalling um, that this uh, white coach who uh, coach predominantly, uh, I think it, it's reported that 95% of the kids that he coach, um, coach were African American children. And he, it, I mean, the way the N word rolled off his tongue, you could tell he was very comfortable using this word. And so it's uh, a word that is apparently a, um, a part of his lexicon that he uses frequently. And it's just, you know, it's disappointing. I mean, because, you know, we would like to think as parents that when we um, entrust adults with our children, that they have their best interests at heart and they're not harboring any um, negative opinions or stereotypes about our children. Um, and then, but we're finding out time after time whether it's a teacher or a coach or a, 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 a priest or a, a church official that has negative um, views of Black people in general and would use racial epi epithets to refer to them. So it's very disheartening. Um, and I obviously think that this guy should be, he should not be around another child, let alone black children. He shouldn't be around any children because this is, you know, he may have a negative influence on um, non-black children to, it, you know. It's amazing to me that you work with African-Americans and these are kids. Um, you have a chance to mold their lives and talk to them and you're with them all this time. And a, it, there were a couple of black players that 
but like still cool with him like talked to him on a regular basis and said like i didn't know he was a man like this um we talk often and to have him make these videos now is just it didn't make sense so all we can do is like you know pray for mark taylor hope but, he gets his situation correct but correct it okay but but i, I just wanted to to raise the issue of, I mean, since um, you have kind of convinced me that I should try to see both sides of an issue. And I think what he did was reprehensible, but I could see, you know, maybe, I don't know, but maybe he felt so comfortable being around black people where he felt like, you know, how some non-black people think that because they, they, uh, they, appreciate the black community and they may feel comfortable in the black community. They feel as if they can use these terms, but he didn't use the term. And I see your point. He didn't yeah. use the term in an endearing way. He wasn't riding through Atlanta saying, yeah, he's all my niggas out here. What up? What up Tyrone? He wasn't saying true. that. That's he true. Was saying his, his, his intent was definitely seen on the video. He was but let me in a different way. But let me ask you this. What do you think is worse? Do you think it's worse to harbor these ill feelings about black people and not ever let it come out? Or do you think it's better to just be upfront with it? If you don't like black people or if you think it's cool to use the N word, then you're just going to be out with it and let us know so we can govern ourselves accordingly. Like sometimes it's the devil, you know, is better than the devil. You don't know. Like what, what do you think is worse? Because we don't if know. You never know if you never know the devil, like there could be a homicidal, psychopathic murderer that can help you change your tire and get you out of a situation where there was a storm and you didn't even know that. You thought he was a good citizen or being a good citizen or a kind citizen at that point in time. And then two weeks later, you see that they were on a manhunt from them. You you so you were like, wow, God watched over me then. You know, and I'm saying, you, you understand what I'm saying? So you you don't know. Not cause if you knew this guy was coming toward you, yeah, you would get out of Dodge. It's like, oh, no, I'll, I'll ride this flat tire until the rim bends. You know, I get that. So I, I don't. I guess what I'm saying question. is, I guess what I'm saying is many of us, we, we, we live and work around these kinds of white people, but we never know that they are harboring these stereotypes about black people or harboring ill will towards black people because they, it just never comes out of their this mouth. This is not popular. What I'm going to say that right. works with every race. I know, I'm but sure my question to you is what, hold do you, on, let what, me finish. You, 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 so that would be to anybody like, should we come out to, I, I know black people that can't stand white people straight up. I don't fuck with them. And I know you probably know black folks like that too. So, and, and we in a workplace full of white folks, right? So should they know, right? <laughs> that you well, feel I, that way? Yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is I'd rather know than not know. I'm glad because the truth eventually will come out. If you, if you work around someone like that, eventually it's going to come out. Do you know what I mean? So I'm glad I would hope my my relationship with him or her on the job would change the way they feel. Like That's when they get way to know, look at it. like if they get to know you and you go out to lunch and you be your funny self and things of that nature, then they get to know. Say, I'm giving you a fictional girl, a woman on your job, Barbara. She's funny too. Y'all invite her out. She has fun, and then all of a sudden, like she's like, well, I was told. African Americans was this way, but I see they're friendlier than the friends that I have, you know. So, I, I, I so I would rather not know because if someone told me and I still had to work with them, it just wouldn't. I don't want to go in thinking every day like, is this and like now if he didn't work with me, okay, I understand that. But if I work with him, like I don't want to be working with somebody who harbors ill feelings toward black bodies. No. I I I I will, I'm going to go on record saying I do want to know. Um and I actually would also say that I think that I would be a, 
there may be, you know, some cases where I wouldn't know, but I feel like I can read people pretty well. And I think I would know whether this is a person that I don't really want to interact with or be around because I mean, these black football players in. Well, I, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know what to say about that, but this is just crazy. I, oh my God. Who knows what this guy is? It was is. incredibly stupid and ignorant on his part, though. And, we, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he responds or has anything to say. Or... I mean, they went to his house. He didn't respond to anything. Mm-hmm. I hope he's fired. I think he did get let go. And let us move on. I like, I like, I like it. Okay, our last plug for the week is our podcast plug. And this is Social Proof, Guide for Everyday Entrepreneurs by David Shans and Donnie Wiggins. Um, This David Shans, and I can say to you too, is a person that we need to start um, listening to. He's big on podcasts, and he feels that doing podcasts can change your your world, your financial world. Mm-hmm. And even if you don't have a lot of followers, but shout out to the folks who are following us at Pot Liquor Podcast. So this is, yeah, Social Proof, a guide for everyday entrepreneurs. He has more than one podcast, but I was put on by a friend and said, hey, you should check this out. And it's uh, pretty good. Pretty okay. good. I'll have to check that out. Let us move on. All right. So we want to give it up to Justin Jones and Justin Pearson. They were reinstated. We talked about them last week, but they mm-hmm. were reinstated um, back in the Tennessee Senate. So kudos to them and keep up your fight brothers anything you have to say about that they did the right thing okay thank god all right so with that being said we will what's going on oh well as here we go as always, we go to our recap of the week. Our plugs first. Prada glasses, Chanel b- bag. We were stunting on them today. Uh, <laughs> and our podcast the Social Proof Guide for Everyday Entrepreneurs. All right, our stories we did. Texas City gets first. Okay, to build that limits teaching political beliefs. Uh, we then visit Morgan State. Wall comes down. Tim Scott and Black Republicans. Uh, Question of the week. What are two things you can never eat for breakfast? Little known black history fact is about Dr. Percy Julian. Um, we buy black segment featured Venus Williams 11. Check her out. I all hell no went to coach Mark Taylor and we gave it up to uh, Pearson and Jones. They got reinstated by the Tennessee legislature. So as always, Thank you, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us today. And as always, in parting, we wish you love, peace, and soul. And so, y'all have a good one. We will see you next week.